This is the side assembling of a 10,000 horsepower handling big black rear end. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Um, it just brings on more videos and more understandings of these crazy top fuel machines. I want you guys to know a little bit more about this Chrisman rear end that we run in our top fuel car. These are the mounting plates uh, to the chassis. This will be the first thing that we put on um, this center section of this rear end. Um, basically just goes over a set of studs and then the spindle <clears throat> actually comes over uh, and kind of smashes that up against the uh, center section. So the next thing we do is we'll actually just add some adhesive, uh, basically some RTV silicone. We use Kimball Midwest silicone, and, you know, we buy it in quantity, of course, and use a, uh, a caulking gun for it. But um, it seems to work the best. Um, it seals good, and it's fairly easy to get the part back off because, you know, 50 runs or so, we're actually uh, replacing the gear in these things. You know, one thing that people do or tend to do is just use too much silicone. You have to know that it's just a light coat of silicone. If you have flat surfaces, it's just perfect. To have it all ooze out everywhere and, you know, it's just, a, I think, a, a train wreck of events. Also, it can be pulled off and actually it can hold up the part from being flat, you know, against another flat surface. Once I got that thing up against the uh, center section, the next thing we're going to work on is the actual spindles. What the purpose of the spindle is, is it actually holds the hub. Now the hub you see here down in the left hand corner of the video with the wheel studs hanging out of it. Um, you know, this again, silicones onto the actual, um, what would you say, the mounting plate for the rear end. You know, uh, over the years I've always wondered why, you know, uh, there wasn't a built-in o-ring for this setup and then you could use maybe just a touch of silicone but this is really reliant just on silicone maybe i'll talk to old chrisman and say hey man the next set you made for me uh let's put an o-ring groove in this thing and uh that way we don't have to jack with the silicone because you know once you take it apart of course you've got to clean all these parts up uh you know knock the silicone off them I mean, it's not the easiest thing in the world and it's just kind of a pain in the ass really so the next gig here we just uh Put this old puppy on here um you know these spindles actually after a certain point uh say two ring set two ring gear sets so what's that uh, 100 runs <clears throat> they actually oblong and that's from when you hit the gas the rear end twisting you know back and forth it actually moves that spindle because that spindle is aluminum they do make a steel spindle but um you know for weight reasons, a lot of people run the aluminum ones, and they tend to oblong, and then you have a hell of a time putting the nuts on them. Now, these washers that I'm putting on here are basically, um, they're like ARP, and the 12-point nuts are also ARP, along with the studs. Um, but those washers actually have a bevel on one side. Basically, those are made for bolts, not studs, per se, the bevel part of it. The bevel part would go towards the head of the bolt, here on this application, it can go either way, but I like putting the flat surface up against, say, if it's up against aluminum or what have you. So I'll just run these things down, uh, you know, with a little electric gun, nothing spectacular or whatever. And then once I run these things down, we'll uh, torque this thing up. Now, anything that is, say, circular and has multiple studs on it, that kind of thing, you really want to work in a star pattern, per se. Um, first thing I do is go 90 or 180 degrees each direction, and then I'll just come back and, you know, go like 100 degrees or whether from the last bolt. Um, that way, so you're clamping it down evenly, and you don't have a mistake where it actually hangs it up on one side, and then you're actually torquing something that is hung up on a stud, which isn't a good thing. Once I torque them in that fashion, then I'll just run back through them all and, and make sure I didn't miss one. So this is the basic setup here. So that's kind of what it looks like, and we'll do this exact same thing to the other side. Normally when I train someone to do this, it's usually done by either the clutch assistant or the actual clutch person. And um, I, I made a book, so 
I try and idiot proof everything I do. It goes down to, you know, backlash, to torque specs, to what to look for in a rear end when you're rebuilding this thing. So next what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the uh, brake caliper brackets. Again, uh, we use PFC brakes and they're the only brake in top fuel that actually mount like this. They call this a radial mount and basically it's kind of like a main cap on a block. So you can see here, it has studs that stick straight out from the mounting bracket. Those studs go in straight, uh, you know, 90 degrees or whatever you want to say to the caliper and then it bolts on from the back end side instead of being like on the side of the bracket when that happens that bracket can actually flex one way or another then that causes the actual rotor and the pads to wear uh, unevenly so i have some kimball midwest i use red loctite on this thing this is the last thing that you want uh, to fall off but you know if you go to like a, a lot of the different locking style um, you know uh, liquids and things like that Loctite, Kimmel Midwest um, if you go to the websites it tells you actually not to put it on the bolt but actually put it in the female part of the threads you know basically my whole life I've always put it on per se the bolt or the stud itself if you put it on the bolt it tends to chase it back up the thread and not down into the female part of the thread. If you put it on the female part of the thread, it actually pushes it in the hole. So you're getting coverage on all the thread. You, you know, a lot of people actually use too much of this. It really doesn't take a whole lot. I put a drop on the male and I put a drop in the female. That way everything's covered. Then I'll run these things down with a gun and we'll get ready to torque these things up. Again, we'll just do this in a star pattern that way. So we're just trying to get an even clamp load, uh, you know, when we put this thing on. So the next thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to shove an axle in this thing. But I want to explain something first. So the pinion drives the ring gear. The ring gear sets right here. Now, that's where all the load is being distributed from is the actual ring gear. So you'll see here that one side of the axle is longer than the other, you know, from spline to spline. If you put this axle in backwards, it's only working on, say, a quarter of those center splines. You hit the gas on that thing, and you're going to rip those splines right off, and this thing's going to maybe go about five feet. So basically what I'm doing here is just make sure there's a little bit of back-to-back, uh, -back that the axle's not being held up anywhere, and um, it all looks good. Next, uh, we're on to the drive hubs. These are... Hubs are somewhat designed like, say, a, a one-ton, you know, dually or something like that. Um, it's basically got two bearings on it, a seal, and uh, a lock nut that holds that thing on there. And that allows it to spin freely, um, you know, without any drive application. What drives the tire is actually this. This is called a drive hub. Those lugs right there is what actually drives the wheel. These splines attach to the axle itself. And actually, that hub drives the other hub with the studs. This thing does not drive off the studs. It drives off those lugs. And later on, I'll show you that on the wheels. Now we're going to install the rotors to the actual hub itself. Again, these are PFC brakes. And this is the way the rotor is actually mounted to the rotor hub. It just has a spring lock that goes around it. And the rotor itself is like full floating on that particular hub there. You know, it takes up to a year to build the material for the brake pads and these rotors. They're compressed um, and heated over a long period of time to actually make the material. So these rotors are held onto the hub by an Allen bolt and some jet nuts. Well, um, I wanted to replace the jet nuts, but I realized that we had to grind down the outer shoulder of these things. If you look here, uh, a new jet nut compared to the old one, you'll see that it's just smaller in diameter. And that's because if it's not like that, it'll rub up against the side of the actual uh, hub and it will not tighten up correctly. So I threw my nuts up on the lathe. Oh God. Buzzed them down. And then I just had kind of basically a go no gauge on this. And then I uh, kind of took off the sharp edges. And then I just did this uh, nine more times.
this is an old Harbor Freight lathe I got like 15 years ago off eBay. And it's not real precision, so this is the kind of work I like doing on it. So I ran a couple bolts on it, and I want to show you where this uh, clearance issue was. So right there you can see there's a radius down inside there too. So in order to make it right, that's what you have to do. So ran them all in, and then torqued them up. And after this, we're going to install these hubs onto the spindles. Now that they're all torqued down here, we're going to install this hub onto the spindle. Uh, take a little grease and lubricate the area where the seal is going to ride. You can see here, the seal actually rides on that larger diameter, the bearing sit on the other part, and then the locking nut goes on those threads right there. And you can see that that hub is not driven by that axle. Once it's up there, then I'll take the inner sleeve, that's the sleeve that goes in between the two bearings. It's basically like a crush sleeve, but it's solid. So the bearings are actually pressing up against that, not just up against the races. That way it sets the tension or preload on that hub. So basically you really can't over tighten it if that sleeve is the right uh, length. I just run a little bit of gear lube on the bearings. I don't pack them. That will prevent the oil from the differential coming out to lubricate that hub. Oil actually flows down through that spindle, comes up into that bearing hub assembly. So that hub will actually be the same level as the oil that's inside the differential. So I run that locking nut in. I torque the shit out of it. I'll spin it a couple times. And then I'll untorque it, spin it, torque it again, spin it again, and that's going to be my setting. Again, it's up against that solid crush sleeve. So when it's right, it's not too loose and it's not too tight. When you crank on this thing from, say, just from medium tight to full tight, and it doesn't change uh, the amount of friction, basically, what it takes to turn that hub, then you know that that sleeve is correct. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to lock that nut into place. There's two small allens that are on that nut. They have a little bit of plastic on the end of them, so we run those in and that locks that nut up against those spindle threads. This here is the access hole through the hub to tighten those uh, allens. There's one on each side of that nut. Now that allen with the plastic on the end of it, what it's there for is to prevent uh, from damaging the threads that are on that spindle. My buddy over at John Force Racing says he shows these videos to all his guys uh, for training videos. I thought that was pretty cool. This is the drive hub. Uh, it has an O-ring on it, so that's what seals the fluid from leaking out from it. Those are the drive hub splines. That's what the axle goes to. And this is what the axle actually drives. Now, those uh, lugs that are on there, that's actually what drives the wheel itself, not the stud the actual lugs. And I'll show you here in a little bit what the wheel looks like. Um, but you don't want it driving off the studs. You want it driving on something solid, like basic, like a big gear. So I put a little anises uh, on the inside of this hub because it is going onto a steel axle and it's aluminum. You just don't want them to galled up. Yeah, they're anodized, but the anodizing starts to wear off and this prevents that from happening. So I'll get this hub lined up. And you got to make sure that the axle is lined up with the splines. Get that set, and then you can knock this thing on. So we'll just tap it on with a hammer here. Now, there's two uh, countersink Allen uh, bolts that go in here. And so I don't want those coming out, so I red lock tight those in and just hand tighten them. When you bolt the wheel on, the wheel actually holds that drive hub up against the uh, inner hub. And so basically those are just so that hub doesn't fall off. Um, then I'll put the plug in the actual access hole for those Allens that were on the inside that we tightened the nut on. And that part of the assembly is done. Now, really all we have left to do is to put a cap on the end of this. So we just put a little bit of silicone on it and it has about, I think, 8 or 10 uh, little 10, 24 Allens that hold it on. So once we get that on, that's going to finish up this uh, assembly on the actual spindle part of this rear end. In my next video, I'm gonna show you how the uh, lug drive system works on the wheel. We're gonna mount some calipers, and then we're gonna shove this thing back into the chassis. If you could, please subscribe and like this video. This is in-depth information on top fuel cars. Nobody does this.